So the gastrointestinal tract of a horse, this is it, um, in drawing form, obviously. Um, so the, there's the stomach, the little ball at the top there, and then the small intestines, a long wiggly bit, and it's not actually a long wiggly bit of hose, it's all joined together with a very thin piece of membrane. Um, but just in this drawing, it's drawn as a long wiggly bit. Um, and then the, the big bit at the bottom is the hind gut. So we'll go through each of the bits um, and talk about what they do. So the stomach, um, the stomach's main job is just controlling the release of the food, the digester that the horse has eaten, into the small intestine. So it's quite clever in that it can pick up, is the food high in fat or is it high in protein? Will it take a long time to be broken down in the small intestine? How slowly should I release it into the small intestine? So given the chance, it'll hang on to food for as long as it can and then just release it really slowly into the small intestine where a lot of the digestion takes place. So that's its main job. Um, a little bit of protein digestion does start there, so there is some, um, some breakdown of the protein. Uh, and another important thing that happens in there is that minerals will dissociate. So I'm sure you've all heard of things like magnesium oxide being fed to horses as a source of magnesium. We put it in pretty much every horse feed that is made. Um, it can't be absorbed as magnesium oxide. It needs to dissociate, so break apart, so it needs to break into magnesium and the oxide bit to be absorbed. And a lot of that for a lot of minerals happens in the, in the stomach. Um, same copper sulfate. Again, we use it pretty much in every horse feed that's made. Um, it can't be absorbed as copper sulfate. It needs to break up into copper and sulfate. So a lot of that, um, what we call dissociation, happens in the stomach. Um, and some minerals need that acidic environment in the stomach because there's a lot of acid produced in there. So magnesium oxide is a good example. It needs the acidic environment of the stomach to actually um, dissociate. The important things to remember with the stomach, it is little compared to the size of a horse. So um, if you ever do a post-mortem on a horse, or I haven't um, taken too many horses apart, thankfully, but um, you take the, the stomach of a 500-ish kilo horse out and it'll fit inside really easily inside a 10-litre bucket. So it's tiny compared to the size of the actual animal, um, which means that they can't with its, its very first job of controlling the release of digester into the small intestine, if you fill it up with a big meal and it's full and then the horse keeps swallowing food, the only thing that can happen is it, get, it has to be forced out of the stomach probably faster than what the horse would actually like to release it out of the stomach, um, which is a big part of the reason why um, you, see, you hear and, and see the little and often written all the time, feed horses little and often, it's because you don't want to fill the stomach up and then have it full and have the horse still swallowing food because it means that it's going to, the stomach loses its ability to control the release of food into the small intestine, it just is physically um, being forced to release it as fast as the horse is swallowing it. Um, another really important thing with the horse's stomach is that acidic gastric juices are secreted continuously. So this is very different to us as humans and very different to something like a dog that's a meal feeder. So us as humans, because we eat our food in very distinct meals, what our brain and our stomach have learnt to do is that when we um, see food and start to think about eating food and actually physically eat some food, our stomach switches on acid production so that we're producing acid for the time that there's actually food entering the stomach. And then when we stop eating, so when we you know, go to sleep at night, um, there's a very long period of time when we're not eating, our stomach actually shuts off acid production. So we don't make any gastric acid while we're asleep at night. So we don't wake up in the morning with a massive stomach full of gastric acid. The horse, on the other hand, has evolved as a grazing animal that really virtually never stops eating. So yes, I'll go and have a bit of a snooze for a few hours at a time, but if you watch grazing horses, they'll eat, 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 and then they'll have a bit of a snooze, and they might have a bit of a play, and then they'll go back and eat for a bit longer, and then they'll have a bit of a break. But the breaks they take from grazing are rarely ever longer than about two hours. Um, you, you rarely see a horse that's able to go and graze freely, have a break for about two hours. So because they evolved like this, their stomach never needed to switch off gastric acid production because they were virtually always eating and there was always food in the stomach. So they don't have an on-off switch for gastric acid production, which means if you put a horse in a stable and feed it, even if you feed it quite late at night, um, it's going to have several hours standing around not eating anything and the stomach is just producing gastric acid. And it ends up, because um, it's also not chewing and saliva is really important to buffer that acid and, and keep the pH 
not as acidic. Um, so they're not chewing and they're producing all this gastric acid and there's no food in there and they just end up with this massively um, acidic environment in their stomach when they don't eat for long periods of time because there's no off switch on their, on their acid production. I often talk to other nutritionists saying we really need to redesign the horse um, and that is one thing on top of the list is actually having the on-off switch, but our chances of actually achieving that are zero, so we'll just have to deal with what we've got. Um, so the, the top section of the horse's stomach is not protected from acid. The bottom part's protected because that's where the acid is produced and that's where it all pulls. So when the horse was evolving, the stomach was smart enough to know, well, oh, I really need to protect myself from the acid down here. So there's a lot of cells that secrete mucus and protect it down there. But again, when the horse was evolving, because its stomach was never, ever, ever empty because it was eating all the time, it didn't need to protect the top part of the stomach because it was never really acidic in there and the acid never had an opportunity to splash up to the top. So there's no protection up there because that's the way the horse was designed. It's very different the way we feed horses now and work them. Um, that becomes a big problem. We'll talk about ulcers um, later. But essentially, when you get acid from the bottom splashing up onto this unprotected part in an empty stomach in a horse that hasn't eaten for several hours, it's a perfect recipe for causing ulcers. Um, so the stomach is never supposed to be empty, and it's important to remember that saliva um, is really important for the buffering of the stomach. So buffering is just... Um, it, it'll bring, so the acidic um, gastric juices are, are very low pH. It can get down to a pH as low as 2 in the horse's stomach sometimes, but if, you, if they're swallowing saliva, um, that saliva will bring the pH up a lot closer to, to neutral. Um, all right. So the small intestine is a long wiggly bit. Uh, in a 500 kilo horse, it's probably about 27 metres long. It's, it's quite long. <laughs> um, and a lot of stuff happens in the small intestine. So here is where protein, fat, and what we call non-structural carbohydrates, so things like starch that you get in cereal grains, which we'll talk a lot about later, um, and simple sugars that you get in pastures are digested in and absorbed from the small intestine. So a lot of stuff happens in the small intestine, which is why the stomach has the job of just releasing stuff slowly there so that the small intestine actually has time to get around and, and um, digest everything. So in the small intestine, digestion is facilitated by things we call enzymes. Um, and the best way to think about an enzyme is just as a tiny little pair of scissors. So um, this, the gut is really quite clever in that um, the gut, what's inside the gut is actually outside of the horse's body. So yes, it's, in, it's inside there, but it hasn't actually entered the horse's body. Um, and the gut has to be really careful in what it will allow to enter the horse's body and the size of things it will allow to the, into the horse's body. Um, so it will only allow the absorption of tiny, like the most minuscule little particles, because if it allowed the absorption of things that were quite big, like a, a full-size bacteria, you would all of a sudden have a horse that just had bacterial infection the whole time. Um, so it has to actually be a really, really clever barrier against um, things that, you know, toxins and bacteria and things that you really don't want in the bloodstream of your horse. But at the same time, it has to allow the absorption of, um, you know, the proteins and the fats and the, and the starches. So um, what these little enzymes do is take big molecules. So they'll take something like a piece of starch, which is, um, I, this is what I... <laughs> I use to demonstrate what starch looks like. So starch is just a whole bunch of glucose molecules joined together. And some of them do literally look like this. They're just all little bits of glucose in a, in a long, straight chain. Um, now, that can't be absorbed because it's too big. But what the enzymes do is come along and chop that into single little glucose pieces. And then once they're just one little glucose piece, it's small enough to be absorbed and it can go into the bloodstream. So it happens. Um, protein is made of um, amino acids, which we'll talk about um, later and I'll show you how they work. So enzymes just chop a protein into all these single little tiny bits of amino acid and they can be absorbed and fats get chopped into fatty acids um, and then they can be absorbed. So there's a lot of chopping up that happens in the small intestine. So it kind of, it's sort of a long process. Um, so the longer you can let stuff sit in the small intestine, the better, which comes back to why you want to feed little feeds often as opposed to big meals, because as soon as you feed big meals, stuff starts flying through the small intestine and there's just not enough time um, to chop stuff up. If I, a good way to think about that is um, if there was starch travelling through the small intestine, if I gave you a pair of scissors and came up to you and said, all right, you ready? I want you to chop up this up into glucose and went like this, 
you would have hardly any chance to chop anything up. So if stuff is travelling really quickly, there's not much time to do much chopping. If I walked past you really, really slowly, you'd chop it to pieces because you've got time to do that. So that's all that's happening in there. You've got to give the little, um, the little enzymes a chance to actually chop stuff up so that the horse can absorb it. Because if it doesn't get chopped up, it just keeps travelling on down the, small, down the small intestine and into the hind gut. <laughs> A lot of absorption of vitamins and minerals happens in the small intestine. So this is where calcium is absorbed. It's where a lot of your trace minerals like um, copper and selenium are absorbed. So again, you want to give them time to actually be taken up um, in there. Important things to remember is the, the passage rate is quite rapid through the small intestine. Um, so again, little and often, the, the slower you can make it, the better. Um, horses digest protein and fats really efficiently, so their enzymes for chopping up protein and fat are very, very um, clever in that they can chop up and, and allow the horse to absorb pretty much all of um, what you feed. And it, it makes sense when you think about where horses have evolved on really rough um, country, you know, in Spain and in parts of Asia. The forage quality they had there was was pretty rough, um, you know, and they did long, hard winters on, on very snowed under um, tough forage, so they had to be able to get every bit of protein out of whatever they were eating because they weren't getting much protein. So they are very good at digesting protein, and for whatever reason, we can feed horses a massive amount of oil, and they seem to be able to chop it up and absorb it pretty efficiently as well. Starch, on the other hand, from raw cereal grains, so things like cracked corn and um, rolled barley, is very, very difficult for a horse to digest. So they'll only digest about 25% of the starch in the small intestine, and the rest will happily keep going on through to the hindgut, which we'll talk about um, later. So, and the horses don't have the enzymes necessary to digest fibre in the small intestine, and no mammal does. Um, so they can't, they can't actually chop fibre up in the small intestine, which is why they have this <laughs> massive, massive hindgut. Um, so the hindgut includes the cecum, which is essentially like our um, appendix. It's the bit that kind of pokes off the end all by itself. Um, and then there's the large colon, which is this bit here, and the small colon, and then this is the rectum where the manure comes out. Um, so its, its primary purposes are the digestion of fibre. So because the horse didn't have its own enzymes to break down fibre, what it's done, however many millions of years ago, was strike up a conversation with a whole big bunch of bacteria and say, all right, I've got a problem here. I need to exist on this really high fibre diet. I can't digest the fibre, but it's all I've got to eat because I've been chased out of the forest by predators and I need to exist on these grasslands. If we give you somewhere warm and cosy to live that's dark, there's no oxygen, would you digest the fibre for us? and give us whatever you don't need, whatever's left over from your fermentation process. So that's essentially what happens, a symbiotic relationship. Um, so the bacteria live in the horse's hindgut, they ferment the fibre, they give the horse the volatile fatty acids, which is like a byproduct for the bacteria, they don't want it, but the horse absorbs it very efficiently and it, it makes up probably, in a grazing animal, maybe 80, 70 to 80% of a horse's um, energy or calories that it uses. Um, and, and in return, they give the bacteria a nice, wet, warm place to live and they can reproduce and live in there happily ever after. Um, the, the bacteria also produce a lot of vitamins for the horse. So they produce a lot of your biotin and your vitamin K and, and all of your B vitamins. Um, so they're really important from a, a vitamin production perspective as well. Um, absorption of minerals happens in the, in the hindgut. So the horses are a little bit unusual in that they, this is where they absorb phosphorus. Most animals absorb phosphorus in the small intestine, but horses absorb it in the, in the large intestine. Um, the electrolyte minerals get absorbed there, so sodium, chloride, potassium will be absorbed in the uh, large intestine. If vitamins obviously can be absorbed because the bacteria are producing them and then the horse absorbs them from the hindgut. And a lot of water absorption um, occurs here too because in the small intestine, they actually the horse releases a lot of water into the small intestine and then in the hindgut, um, it pulls a lot of water out. So if you, look at the, if you look at the gut contents in the cecum and colon, it'll all be slushy and slushy, but by the time it comes out as manure, it's actually quite dry because the horse has pulled a lot of water out of it so it doesn't get dehydrated and doesn't have to drink too much. Um, so points to remember, um, I've got billions of bacteria, I probably should say um, billions and billions, trillions, there's a lot of bacteria. They reckon in, in humans, they, there's estimates of between the same number of bacteria as we have human cells, up to 10 times the number of bacteria as we have human cells. 
Um, so it, it's, an un, it's a staggering amount of bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract. So in the horses, which is much bigger than ours, um, it'd be, I, I can't even guess how many more times, but a lot of bacteria live in there. Um, so the bacteria do have the enzymes necessary to digest fibre via fermentation. They have an unbelievable array of scissors in their armoury. So anything they come across pretty much they need to break down, they just whip out another enzyme um, and chop it up so that it, it can be fermented. Bacteria can also break down phytate to, absorb phosph uh, to enhance phosphorus absorption. So a lot of phosphorus in things like cereal grains is actually attached to this stuff called phytate. And if you feed that to a pig which absorbs phosphorus in its small intestine, it can't absorb that phosphorus. But if you feed it to a horse, they can because it gets into the hindgut and the, the bacteria actually chop the phosphorus off the phytase and give the phosphorus to the horse. Um, so it, it's kind of handy that phosphorus absorption happens in there. Um, and the bacterial fermentation of fibre produces volatile fatty acids, which you'll normally see abbreviated to VFA. Um, and that's what the horse uses as a source of energy. In, in fibre-based diets, or in any diet really, where there's forage, which should be every horse's diet, because all their diets should be based on forage. So that's their gut. Um, so our, our challenge is the fact that horses are designed to graze these high fibre forages over long periods of the day. And we often need them to eat high energy cereal grain-based diets that are fed in meals. So if you wanted to pick two more opposing nutrition strategies, it'd probably be those two. Um, unfortunately. So our challenge is to feed these high energy diets without disrupting the function of the gastrointestinal tract, um, which you can do, but you need to be careful how you do it. So doing a good job allows horses to consume enough energy on a daily basis to work, race, breed and grow whilst remaining healthy. You can get it wrong and we cause problems like gastric ulcers, hindgut acidosis, laminitis, colic, loss of appetite, weight loss um, and poor performance. So, I mean, we can definitely do it, but you can also definitely stuff it up and, and make the horse quite sick in doing so. So a large part of doing a good job, it, it lies in selecting a quality feed. Um, and we'll go over having a look at what makes a quality feed.